please welcome to the stage, Dr. Mike Leahy. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Leahy, the current steward of the Tactical Technology Officer, TTO. DARPA plays a unique role in the ST ecosystem. We depend on the others for labs, test facilities, assets, subject matter experts, and growing our future PMs. We also don't have a monopoly on DARPA-worthy investment ideas. We do have a big checkbook and all the core supporting capabilities to turn big, hairy, audacious dreams into reality. I'm here to stimulate your imagination, to motivate you to dream about what the future could look like and the outside role you could have in creating that future. So put down the cell phones, close the laptops, turn off that second screen on the virtual side. All right, we're going to have a fun ride through what we can do and what would make that possible. I'm going to encourage you to think big, bet big, win big, to join in our mission to redefine possible. I took the TTO mission statement, and we created this word cloud. Many of these phrases apply across the agency. At its core, we get the chance to redefine possible. Take a concept for enabling a new game-changing military capability and convert it from PowerPoint to reality. We do the analysis to figure out what is the missing or immature technology and remove that limitation via a demo at credible scale in real-world environments. I'm not limited by mission boundaries or cultures of individual services. We work in all four physical domains. No bio in this presentation. Air, space, maritime, ground, and frequently the seams between them. We don't create the effects, but we deliver them to where they need to be to be effective. Our focus is on platforms, experimental platforms, X-planes, X-ships, et cetera, projects where the laws of nature still get a vote. Demo platforms, system technologies at credible scale and realistic environments. Real physical systems, high risk, high payoff bets. Let's take a quick trip down memory lane to put our impacts into sharper focus. We'll touch on a few of the wall-worthy past success stories, some of those on the wall that's out there that you can see. Because we do physical things, many of the touchstones DARPA is known for came from system demos. Stealth, everything unmanned, uncrewed, space access, robotics. Look across those four lines, I have an affinity for some of those on the top. We define what it meant to be to be auto autonomous systems. All right, we've been up on orbit We're, uh, with Orbital Express many moons ago, and now finally going to culminate that on RSGS. You saw yesterday when Stephanie talked about the Saturn V, well, before there was a Falcon 9, there was a Falcon 1 right, that we sponsored. And that was a great success story because we got not only a military capability, but also crossover onto the civilian side. And then we took what we learned in the air side and the ground, and we brought it across the maritime. Famously, when we first did Sea Hunter with a note from the Navy that thou shalt not interface with DARPA on this particular activity to now they own and proudly use that system out in RIMPAC. Right, to other things in underwater and the like. And then on the ground side, the, our famous grand challenges, our robotics challenges. There's a video out there now of a robot that can run almost run a marathon. And then the last one on the bottom there, that dark mirror episode with the dogs always just freaks me out. Um, so there's no overarching detailed plan for how we invest in platforms. We famously don't roadmap or follow a rigid multi-year investment strategy. My strategy is this simple. Find inflection points, place big bets. Today we do that across five Ds. That's part of the distributed nature of the title of the talk was. Right, so almost everything we do is not going to put some big school bus on orbit or go look at the evolutionary part of an X-joint fighter, but it's going to be disaggregated, disruptive, right? Distributed, disassociated, any one of the D you want to use, and even a little bit of doubt in the mind of what we want to do it. Adversary gets a vote. And we're always responsive to the national security strategy. So we are redefining space capabilities, robotic service and geospace, or RHGS on the top. We'll show a video of that a little later. Leading the nation's efforts in hypersonic weapons with the tactical boost glide, TBG, and the hypersonic air breathing concepts, Hawk projects. There's no wood to knock on, but hopefully this month in November, we'll finally have made enough sacrifices to the test gods that we can get off what we need to be able to do. We're exploring new ones to bring medium-sized 200-ton ships into fight with no man-required ship or no Mars, and sea train to be able to transit them to where they need to go. And we're re-envisioning liberty ships for the 21st century and much more. One constant 
is how we do, we do not do science projects or stunts. We do our homework up front on defining an objective system or OS. We're going to prove to ourselves that if we could solve the tech challenges, it wouldn't matter. Somebody would care, and we have a discriminating kind of capability, a new class of system. I'm going to outline a little bit what that reference concept looks like and what elements does DARPA need to bring in life in a demonstrator. So look at it, decompose it. Are the supporting pieces in place so that now only one consecutive miracle away from building that DS or demonstrator system? Particular example shown here is from a recently completed Gremlins project. So in Gremlins, the idea was we wanted to be able to launch and recover from an aircraft. Launch, not usually the hard part, recover, a little more so. If you looked at that and said, well, what do I need to do that with? Well, I need to have a recovery platform. I need to be airborne. I'm going to do it in a C-130, not because that's the target application, but because there's a ton of them. And you would think they would be certified to come onto bases and you wouldn't have to fl get flight worthiness on them. You would be wrong. Um, so we put the system inside of that to do the recovery. And then we purpose built a small UAS about this size for it because one didn't exist that we could use. And it was stupid. Right, because we've done the smarts somewhere else. We know how to put things together and do collaborative and swarms and all those buzzword technologies. This was lower brainstem activity needed to be able to come up and make that connection. And we'll show a video of how that played out later on. Also, in this particular case, as we went through it, we realized we didn't, weren't in a position to achieve everything we thought, and so we ended up having to stop a little short where we wanted to be, and we'll talk to that. But that paradigm follows just about everything we do. So before we dive, launch, fly, or drive into future platform possibilities. Just a reminder, we get to do that without limitation to individual physical domains or their seams. As a side note, it's an excellent example of how artist concepts are not always bound by the rules of physics. We use that art to communicate without sharing elements of projects that should be protected. And that air vehicle one down there in the bottom, there's this little kind of semicircle dish flying. That's a crane art example. I don't think we're going to make that go, although we've proven we can make a brick fly with the F4. With those four physical domains, we are starting to spend more time in rediscovered places and spaces, asking ourselves how these rediscovered environments should influence our investments. How does environment change how we deter conflict and, if called upon, fight and win? Climate change is now opening up new transit possibilities in the Arctic while still presenting very harsh conditions we'd have to survive and live in. It's also sanctuary for our adversaries. Cis lunar is the new buzz phrase that describes the space beyond geo to just beyond the moon. All right, so if I'm Earth, you know, Leo is right around here, geo's maybe out to the first row, cis lunar is out in the street. All right, it's a vast space, so we gotta be able to figure out how to get around in. There are some unique challenges to being able to do that. There's some unique Lagrange points, there's some three-body problems. Interesting area we wanna be. If we wanna overmatch the enemy, we need a new way to do that. Our most recent robotic challenge dealt with the unique challenges faced by first responders in the military in underground environments. The subterranean challenge, or sub-T, you can check that out on YouTube. It's great. It's just like you're watching a sporting event with com common color casters and everything else. Made impressive strides in overcoming those challenges with new modes of perception, mapping, and across-domain teaming. But those problems are not solved. And for all the talk about darkening the sky with small sats, and we're doing it, most of the world's comm traffic moves on fibers that run across the ocean floor along with rich deposits of high-value minerals. In all these cases, the commercial opportunities are every bit or more compelling than the pure military ones. Still with me? With all that as a backdrop, where do we go from here? How do we boldly go where no platform has gone before? Or boldly revisit a concept or technology that some new adjacent discovery gets inside my one consecutive miracle rule. I'm going to take you on a journey where we stop on a baker's dozen excursions into possible futures. I'm going to hint at the endless possibilities that are out there and encourage you to spend some mental energy helping us to redefine possible. Humans have felt the need for speed well before Maverick and Goose. DARPA has always been at the leading edge of high speed. Over the past decade, our focus was on hypersonic, meaning faster than five times the speed of sound, weapons. We are in flight testing and can see our way clear of that focus. Again, we are a projects agency. And while there is plenty of work remaining to fully mature this class of weapons, our role will end for the moment. So where do we go from here? We've explored hypersonic aircraft for decades in fits and starts and stops, and there's excitement building around commercial applications and companies. 
And to hear Hollywood tell it, we already have those capabilities and challenges solved. But is going faster always the right answer? What if we slowed down? Are there new propulsion concepts that enable us to affordably bridge the gap between subsonic and hypersonic weapons? If I can go about speed Mach 3.5, titanium starts to melt. Okay, so I back up from there. I'll say, if I would go back about 500 nautical miles, I can reach something in 15 minutes. That's still pretty aggressive timeline. Can I do that at a cost and scale that makes it campaign credible? And can I use a new technology called rotary detonation engines? Not really new, it's been around for a while, but it's never been physically brought to practice in a full-on weapon system end-to-end -end demonstration. Are there promising technologies to make that happen? We're out on the street now with our Gambit project that will give us the answer for one application. That was a place where it took two consecutive miracles to get to the weapon, so we're just gonna focus on the propulsion part, flight weight propulsion, and, and can we do it? If we can, it has compelling advantages. If you know anything about my background, you knew this one was coming. UAVs are now everywhere. You can buy a damn capable one from Costco for a couple hundred bucks. So what does the DARPA play? Good question. As much as we are and can should leverage commercial developments from small systems to visions of electric air taxis, there remains unique military requirements, or well, at least ones the military puts more priority on. The artist's concept on the left evokes the holy grail of a runway independence in more clever ways than just adding rotors to existing fixed-wing vehicles. Can I avoid the infrastructure associated with launch and recovery? And by the infrastructure, I mean none on a ship that is you know, motoring ahead and is at maybe sea state three. All right, two people to operate it, some fiduciary on the deck, that's it, I wanna be able to land there. I also wanna do that with a, lot, with a range that matters, a degree of endurance that matters, and a payload that's high enough to matter. All right? That's the question we're gonna go set off to do. Now in all honesty, this is a quest unblemished by success in recent TTO history. We have been willing to, you have to be willing to fail in this business and we have done it. But when the need and value are high enough, you learn your lessons and try again. Our next attempt is called ancillary. I won't try to break that acronym back out for you. We just put that BA out on the street for that. It's a new concept video on YouTube. Looks great. Again, that's not quite physically enabled vehicle, but kind of do the job. You can look at that and get a concept of what we're gonna do. We're gonna do that differently as well. We're gonna do more orals and white papers and other things to get more non-traditional performers into that space. Shifting gears slightly to the right is another concept for the hopeless diamond, right, the high end of the UAS market. Can we reimagine a predator reaper for the high end fight? Do advances in electric power, non-kinetic weapons, modern manufacturing materials, active flow control, and other maturing technologies put us at the foot of the next big step forward? Or is best we can do to continue to evolve and therefore DARPA should focus elsewhere until we're at an inflection point? Speaking of holy grails, what about combining the need for speed with no good places to land? Thinking beyond just UAS class systems to ones that could replace an MV-22, carry some cargo quicker and with higher survivability. Do we need to hover or just get in and out of the soccer field? How far, how fast, in this case better than 400 knots? How big, how affordable? Is there a family of systems or just a group of point designs? Again, are we just one consecutive miracle away? And if we are then, what is the even crazier idea behind that one? Going up a little higher in altitude, I'm showing what's become the iconic white-green graphic from our blackjack program. That's how you know you really made it. When every time somebody talks about perforated LEO, low Earth orbit, your graphic shows up. All right, what this one wants to do is to get the idea that we're going to leverage what's going on in commercial but still have unique kind of military applicability for it. Here we envision a near-term future of large constellations of affordable space vehicles with teraflops of onboard comprocessing, so you could really have a cloud actually in space, and multiple optical data links between within the constellation. So Rusty was up here, he started this program for us, so even as we now struggle with the first tranche of getting the blackjack space vehicles, we already will claim a big transition success with the birth of the Space Development Agency. SDA. Phase one showed a real solution was feasible. The first objective of Blackjack was to convincingly demonstrate the progress being made in the civilian sector could be affordably applied to military applications. That took a full systems program. 
buses, payloads, brains and integration, it was a classic system approach. But we did it differently. I would never recommend to anybody to go buy a satellite or a satellite system this way, but we said first, is there a bus that hits the price point we care about, what capability we care about? Then are there payloads, multiple ones we could put on there? And then is, could we get, put the brains on there with pit boss? And then could we integrate it and put all that together? That's completely back asswards of how you would do that problem. All right, so we wanted to do it that way because we wanted to see every element of that. We didn't want a vertically integrated kind of solution uh, to be able to do it. It's also a classic case where the saying I have is if you show me a DARPA PM who meets his cost and schedule, I'll show you somebody who wasn't trying hard enough. Rusty and Steve Forbes are trying damn hard. Um, and we have had to put more resources in because again, if we knew what it would cost to do it, then by definition, we should not do it, right? It's a journey of discovery. We're gonna go out in phase one, we're gonna learn some things that tell us what phase two needs to be, both because we'll learn some things and because my friends in industry will be a little um, overzealous in how much they think it's going to really cost. And I don't mean that in the over the top way, but the under way. So those two places where we have different things gotta do. Our focus on Peleo was the constellation, right? So we're gonna fly an ISR RF payload that will enable us to affordably demo that power. Six balls up so that as we roll across, we've gotta have four to do the triangulation, you can do that math. We knew we fell a little short of demonstrating the full potential, so we stood up the oversight program to close the gap in Constellation Autonomy, put more things on board, do more of the edge processing we need to do. Now with the SDA stood up and on track to deploy their Trine Zero, although they finally had to admit they have supply chain problems like everybody else, and contracts in place for tranche one, commercial industry on a sharp upward vector. Is there a role for DARPA in this space going forward? Should we be watching or investing in ceilings for the next inflection point? Or is it time to leave this orbital domain and focus elsewhere? I could have titled the next topic, Next Gen Space Vehicles, but I already know that requires a new generation of space propulsion, so let's just go there. The first image is from our Draco project our current bold bet on thermal nuclear, nuclear thermal propulsion, or NTP. NTP is not a new concept. It's been around since before safety was invented in the late 60s, and we could do extensive ground testing in places like Jackass Flats, Nevada. What is new is 30 years of advances in nuclear and material science, a new national space priority policy on HALU. This is your acronym for the day. Repeat after me. High assay, low enriched uranium, right? Under 19%. Also need to conduct missions in this new part of space. The enemy's already out there. We can't let that be unchallenged, and there's a potential big commercial market. It's a prime example of how, in many cases, multiple vectors need to converge to motivate a big bet. And trust me, that'll be a big one when we do it. We are betting that working with NASA, we can conduct an in-flight demo in the FY26-27 kind of time frame that opens the door for a range of civilian and military applications. Again, you'll see the theme across some of our programs. We're going to build that reactor. We're going to take it up and basically have a flying test stand, get it to the point where it cannot go back home, and then be able to make it go critical and prove that it'll work. Right now, the thinking is once we have jump-started NTP, our role here is done for the moment. Can you prove me wrong? In 2024, the partnership of Space Logistics LLC and DARPA will launch a space vehicle with the world's most sophisticated robotics payload. It's got two large seven degree of freedom arms with a range of end effectors and sensors. The bet here is we can jumpstart a viable on-orbit refueling and servicing commercial enterprise. We have a commercial partner in this because we want to buy this as a service. One simple business case, and now they've done this twice without using a robot arm, would have two satellites come close to each other and made up, is that if you can take and extend the life on orbit of a commercial comm satellite, that's worth about $50 million in revenue. You gotta carry an extra year's worth of fuel to get you to the graveyard orbit. So if somebody can get you to the graveyard orbit for less than 50 million, somebody can make some money, and they believe they can. And that's what we wanted to do. From the beginning, we pursued that commercial solution. We don't want to own these. We want DOD to buy as a service and operate a fleet of servicers. It took two tries, but we're confident this time we'll succeed. This system was designed to operate in harsh geo environments for almost a decade. Like many first-of-a-kind systems, is an exquisite solution. We want to explore a wide range of options. We want to break the evolutionary path. Industry was eventually going to put up a one-armed paper hanger to go do this, and they do multiple arms, multiple degrees of freedom. We're going to basically GFE them a capability well beyond that. What we get back out of that is some demonstrations we want 
and ultimately get an industry in place that we want to be able to use. You're going to need to cut the cost and complexity of operations by an order of magnitude going later. That's not a DARPA play. NASA and the commercial players are looking at assembly and manufacturing in lower orbits. It's a lot cheaper space to operate in, and some good momentum is already in place. So have we finally realized the vision we launched at Orville Express almost 20 years ago, and earn a right to kick back, drink a cold one, and watch how this plays out for a while? Is there a tougher operating environment than GEO for robotics? I'm not looking to settle that argument here, but my deep underwater colleagues can make the case. As in space, there's a wide range of commercial and military applications. The oil and gas industry gives us some great use cases to cut our teeth on. You saw the, when I talked up here yesterday in the panel Shack had about Andril and the dive technologies. That's one of those subs that we started. There's another one, commercial company, that's involved in some of our operations underwater as well. We want systems that swim in from a distance, perceive and manipulate objects with minimal a priori info and highly turbid murky waters, meaning I can't see my arm in front of my face, right, all without direct human intervention. That's all. Once we saw that, we're easy. As with space, we're hoping our lead investments will encourage commercial investment and the continued growth of an industry where, again, we can buy services instead of systems. What is the next step jump in capability? Is it greater dexterity? Sensors, perception, affordability. What will you propose when you get your chance as a DARPA PM? To complete the robotic trifecta, we go back to the land. No, not the old Disney Epcot ride. We have built and crashed a fleet of different robotic ground vehicles over the years. I'll show one of them behind, or in front of me here in this case. Runs over big ditches and can do almost 65 miles an hour in flat terrain. But do you see it on the battlefield? No. We have triumphs in mechanical engineering, but failures at the mission level. This is a case where the platform needs to take a back seat to the brains to redefine the possible. Here we need to redefine our approach. So we created an autonomy-focused project, right, by which we provide the physical kit. It's shown over there on the side. It's the best money can buy. It's a dune buggy outfitted with water cooler GPUs. It's got all kinds of sensors on it. So that's not the issue. Now the challenge is get the algorithms that can take advantage of that and figure out how that perception is going to work. Right? Perception and decision making on a surrogate vehicle, only then will I graduate and give you a full 10 ton system demo to play with. Sure, ultimately we have to combine them together, but if you put them together too much at the start, the sexy physical thing always wins. I can retire when software gets the cover of Av Week, but I don't think that's happening anytime soon. I want performers to drive those surrogates like a rental. Right? Success is a road littered with broken down vehicles so we can field robotic combat vehicles, or RCVs, that don't need remote operators just two clicks back. We need things that can run out front and provide the true game-changing scout mission capability. This is a prime example of a Tranche 2 project, and let me explain what that means. Once we can do that, what, is, what we mean by Tranche 2 is there's already, we've done the work for Tranche 1, right? There are programs of record to do robotic combat vehicles, but they're teleoperated because that's the only level of risk Congress will let them take at the moment. We want to brought a person here from the Army Research Lab who spent his career doing that, and our objective is to pull this all forward by a generation. So take tranche two or three and pull it much farther closer to tranche one. That works very well because in that case, you're not taking any risk when you're tagging up to a DARPA program because your program is not directly affected by that. If we can communicate properly with Congress, we can set up what the next piece is, and then we can move it forward. And that also allows us to take risk because we need to be able to be in a position to fail and see what we can learn from it. Once we can do that, right, have these vehicles operating at that speed out in front, and again, no cheats, no GPS, no maps, the 3D surfaces, we can't do the same things the auto industry does on flat surfaces. So we focus our attention on smaller robots working in close collaboration with dismounted units, as illustrated in a top graphic. Is that the next thing? Or is the future frontier in robotics more the combination of platforms? Operating in teams across different domains, air and ground, space and underwater. Is that the key to fully realized vision for a robotic scout? My ground scout robot PM's objective, Stuart Young, is to pull that Army RCV capability forward by a decade. How do you want to change the world? I know it's blasphemous, but let's talk less about platforms and more about different ways to deploy and employ them. An illustrative example here is from a recently completed Gremlins project you saw back in that objective system demonstrator system example. 
Remember here the question we asked ourselves was could we air launch and recover a small UAS but one big enough to perform a relevant mission? Launch, as I said before, is straightforward. Recovery is the challenge. We demoed it could be done. We did it once. All right, we tried a whole bunch of other times. There's a case where we went back multiple times. We had COVID hit us. We had uh, earthquakes at China Lake take that flight range down. We kept investing when we thought we had a path to closure. It was great that we got a demonstration actually done on video, but never believe entirely what those are and what the context is, even when we do them. Um, but we, what we learned is it's doable, but not in the configuration we had. It was not going to be solvable by better software. There were some gnarly problems associated with the airflows across that. So we stopped that program. We set it aside and said we know what we needed to learn. We could fix it if we go ahead and go forward. It's an example of knowing when to call it quits and reset. We've looked at launching from underwater before. We do that routinely, obviously, with missiles. But what about a system that could operate seamlessly across multiple domains? Instead of flying through air defenses, change domains and hit the keep out zone and swim under them. What other multi-domain crazy concepts are out there? Beyond out-of-the-box deployment concepts, what about novel formations? Retain the advantage of a distributed maritime ops without the transit penalty or having to dedicate scarce ships for that purpose. If all my little robot ships need something bigger to take them to the fight, I didn't solve the problem. I just created a different problem. The main graphic here is from our sea train project. The math told us that by combining four medium-sized vessels, we could get the lower wave-making resistance of a longer, more slender hull and improve their transit range by over 30%. So the goal here was nothing short of I wanted to form up off of Coronado Island in San Diego, go across to the inner island chain, disaggregate, perform a mission for a few months, and come home on a tank of gas. All right, that will change what happens. Now, nobody will believe that, nor should they, until we do some scale demo. We've been in the water tanks, we've been in the tunnels, we're going to do a one-third scale demo in the open water. But with that kind of promise, it's worth taking a shot. So what about if I could just tow a series of platforms underwater behind a surface ship? That's the bottom one. Hitch a ride across the Pacific, get dropped off at the desired location without exposing myself along the way. Not as simple as just holding a rope behind a car, but our studies don't, didn't show any showstoppers. Well, they're unique and novel types of formations provide an outsized utility. Almost forgot. Cannot leave the stage without exploring the alternatives for a next generation of surface and underwater platforms. The video illustrates the concept of an underwater platform autonomously navigating while carrying a payload of military significance and staying underwater for extended periods of time because it can generate its own electricity. And that's the key. Right, what we found is you can't just park Connex boxes on the bottom of the ocean because somebody will figure out where those are. You need to be able to get up and move around and you need to stay down for long periods of time. And the only way you're going to do that is if you generate your own power. We have a kite that comes out of here that we're in the tunnels and we're going to test and we're going to be doing this in the water in about a year or so. We think we can generate about a kilowatt of power with a difference in current of only about one knot. If I can do that, I can power this up. I can also potentially be a power station for other things underwater when I go do them. We're converting that cartoon into reality and exploring a way to harvest energy from small differences in those water currents We've also looked at differences in temperatures and other possible solution. What else is out there? On the right is a CAD view of our latest unmanned medium surface vessel. This is the first ship since the advent of sail, designed from the keel up to never have humans on board. Because once you let a human on board, it has to be human rated. Defeats the purpose. Right? This is the follow on to the second part of the problem we addressed with Sea Hunter. Sea Hunter took the executive functions off of the ship. Right, what we're trying to do now is take the rest of those functions out, and those people were there for a reason. All right. So like Manta Ray, this tough little ship is designed to stand away for extended periods of time with up to 100 tons of payload. Use your imagination. Autonomously refuel at sea and only come ashore for depot-level maintenance, where literally you pop the hood, you pull out all these modules, you plug in new ones, and you return to the fight. All right. I don't need VLS tubes because I'm never going to reload. Right? I just need to get off the rail before an incoming comes to me, and at that point, I'll just soon suck up those missiles. Right? I can stay out for a year. I don't need a tow truck to come get me. In worst case, I can limp home at four knots. If you could buy one of those for under $30 million, think of all the trade space that opens up to reimagine what constitutes a surface action group. That ship is second-generation autonomy. The first generation was active, now called Sea Hunter, where we remove those executive functions. Now we're trying to take the rest of the crew out. What does third-generation disruption look like? 
Final new platform mind bender I want to leave you with is seams. Seams between domains, doctrines, cultures. Some of the biggest innovative disruptions live in those seams or others cannot visualize or mentally bridge the gaps. You saw an image of this in Stephanie's first talk in the morning. It had some um, Red Cross symbols on the side because what about the fact that you know, in a future fight in the Pacific, there's going to be people in the water. We need to rescue those people. And we can't rescue them onesies, twosies. Right, what about a ship like this with two hulls at one side, it picks people up, the other side is a hospital. So it lives and it wants to be on the water. Our most recent example is Liberty Lifter, and by definition, and on purpose, if you think of a Liberty ship, that's exactly what we want you to think about, that same analogy, but now it's a 21st century version. It's a big boat, lives on the water, but operates most effectively in ground effect, but can fly up to 10,000 feet if needed. It is a boat that flies. It has no gear, it doesn't come on the land and land. It's capable of performing a, traditional, a range of traditional Marine and Navy and Air Force missions, yet something any individual service, not something any individual service would invest in. I need to get the Navy, the Marines want it, I need to get the Navy interested so the Air Force will try to steal it back. But again, this is just one example. What others are out there that enable a new class of systems or a whole new approach to delivering effects on the battlefield? What seams can we exploit together? The point of this briefing was not to be approved I could entertain you for 30, 35 minutes or so. Hopefully something I said triggered your imagination or made you realize there was a government agency who was just maybe crazy enough to make your dream a reality. Like all the tech offices, we have office-wide broad area announcement, or BAA, to which you can submit white papers and proposals. But please, before you go to that trouble, strongly encourage you to scan our list of PMs on the DARPA website Reach out to the PMs who might be most receptive to the idea. Have a conversation. Respect each, I respect your time and respect theirs. We, of course, post our, our RFIs and BAAs to the appropriate government site and hold industry days. Along with PMs and Project Histories, our public website has a range of resources for how you could work with us. One final note. As may have become evident to some of you in the audience, I was being very careful with my scenarios and examples. So I had to script it out so I didn't get off of it. While there are a wide range of future platforms we can talk about openly, when we get into performance specifications, we need to protect that level of information properly. We also have the means to do fully informed projects and germinate special concepts in special places. Have your security people call our security people. This guided tour of the future is over, but hopefully you will continue to dream big and maybe one day join us to bet big and win big. And I'll be happy to take any of your questions. Thank you. Hello again. All right, first question. Um, and I'll just remind you really quickly that if you uh, would like to pose a question, please submit it via the virtual event platform. For those following along online, you can just submit your question there. But if you're in the audience, please scan the QR code. First question, sir. Does an idea have to have a direct military application for DARPA to consider it? Probably a direct military application would be too strict. It certainly should have something that has an impact to national security. We can take a relatively broad interpretation of that over the agency. Um, we like, we'd ideally like things like Falcon 1, like we're doing with Dive, like we're doing other systems that have ability to transition into the commercial sector and then uh, pull them back. Liberty Lifter, for example, I'd love to get FedEx or somebody to want that so I can get it in a craft fleet and just pick it up that way. So I think that is true, that it does have to have something to do with national security uh, related to it, but we take a fairly broad interpretation of what that wants to be. Okay. Second question. I have an idea for a project that DARPA might want to pursue. What's the best way to pitch that idea? As I said up front, there is no monopoly of ideas inside our building that come from a wide range of places and spaces. Uh, the best one is to uh, you know, look at the different offices. You can learn a lot off our website of what our kind of traditional areas of focus are. Um, you can see the projects that we can talk about that our PMs are doing. Reach out and have that kind of engagement. You can have that on a one-on-one -on -one level. We have ways to do white papers. You can submit them informally or formally. Again, I would encourage you to have some of the discussions before you go to the trouble of trying to document something and send it in. Also recognize that if you engage with us on an idea, right, then you're engaging with me on what I might do. I'm not going to hold that discussion. The specifics of how you do it is proprietary and we'll protect that, but the concept of it is not, right? 
Um, and we will go do seedlings. There's almost nothing that gets done at a TTO level where we're making bets that are hundreds of millions of dollars where we don't do some upfront serious analysis and some legwork with an FFRDC or somebody else to make sure that we have a design or reference design that we believe closes. We'll put those out in videos and others. Please don't think I want you to build that. If that was what I wanted, I would just go get somebody else to build it. It's a reference design. It's meant to encourage and imagine and see what the art of the possible is in terms of doing that. Look for different ideas on how to close that coming back and then work with it. Uh, so it takes some time with that, but you know, if you've got an idea or concept, you can bring it up to one of the PMs. We have, you know, you can put it in through the BAA or just reach us on any of the emails uh, that are out there for it. But know that if it's really got good, you're going to have to compete to win it. But if you think you got an edge, you should be able to maintain it. What skills, experiences, and qualities does TTO look for in potential program managers? So this is me speaking, all right, and my view of what TTO does now we should do it, and this is not generic across the agency, right? Because there are, as you've, if you knew us at all, what you're seeing through here, the kind of talents and techniques you need for someone who's going to do bio is not necessarily what I'm looking for. We're doing complex system level programs, right? I don't take anybody for their first rodeo, right? I want people who have expertise in that particular domain. They're mid-career kind of professionals, right? One of the biggest things you've got to have is you've got to be passionate about that idea. Right, it was brought up when we talked, it came up when they were talking about ARPA-H. Right? DARPA is uniquely a PM-driven organization. Right? The PM is the rock star. Hopefully not a diva, but the rock star we want to do. And we've got to also recognize that you need some good roadies to put on your concert. And we can provide those. You've got to be passionate about what you want to do. You've got to be technically knowledgeable about it. And you've got to be able to listen. Right? And you've got to understand that you will seldom be the smartest person in the room. Not if you put the right people on your team and I can get them all, right? Because that's that team structure, that's what's gonna go solve these tough problems. Because we know going off, we're gonna run into things. We have a whole bunch of known unknowns we're gonna to have to discover and find. So somebody who's got a passion for doing something, for example, I'll again pick on Stuart because we talked about a racer, had a background, spent 20 some odd years in ARL, knew all the people, knew what he wanted to do, was accepted in the community, didn't have the wherewithal to get it done. We do. So we took him, brought him in, and now we're going to do those demonstrations and compress that thing. So you've got to be passionate about it. It's not just a job. It's a four-year sprint or more to be able to do what you want to be able to do. And it's got to be the right point in your career, right, where you can make that dedication, where you can put the energy in required to be able to be successful at what we're trying to be able to do. But you've got to have some experience and grow your way back up to being able to do that and demonstrate that you can handle those kind of uh, complex systems and make those trades. What are the challenges that DARPA faces in turning ideas into reality? Physics. Um, <laughs> uh, we don't get to make it until we fake it in the stuff that I'm doing. Um, so I, I think that the challenge always is, you know, it, it's trying to say that you think you can get there, right, but you're not entirely sure. Right? Because again, if I, if I knew how to do it, then I shouldn't be doing it, but I need to no, I'm, I'm only jokingly use that one consecutive miracle rule because while it's an oxymoron, it's what it's trying to drive to you, is that we're still going to take that risk. Right? We believe it'll close. I never want to enter into a program with industry where I don't believe if they're successful, we can go actually produce something and go field it and fly it or swim it or orbit it. But we can't always do that. Right? And so it's trying to figure out where that balance is and then knowing when to cut bait. Knowing when we just reached a little too far uh, sometimes what it is is not so much that we reach too far, but we're too aggressive in the timeline. Right? Because if I go out in a BAA and I ask you to get something done in, say, three years, surprisingly, they're gonna you're going to propose back three years. And then we're going to dig into it and figure out the schedules backwards and everything, and that informs us and tells us. Because if we don't ask for aggressive one, we won't get it back. So it's figuring out how to take the reasonable level of risk and then to make those trades as we go through uh, the different ideas that we have, and then dis and early on realize if we're going to have a chance to be successful or not. So while we follow a traditional coder, PDR, CDR kind of d development cycle, it's trying to get a lot of ideas up front and then be able to whittle those back down and see if we really care about it. If we do, and it's important enough and it has a big enough impact, we'll find the resources to go get it done. Okay. And this is the final question. What lessons do current, recent current events offer to determine the technology gaps for future application of disaggregated systems in conflict? 
I think what you found is it reinforces uh, kind of the thesis we've had for some time. You know, fixed sites are targets, right? Large systems uh, have uh, become targets as well that we got to figure out how to use the advantages we're going to have from distributed satellites, from comms, from the ability that everything can have autonomy and more processing power into it to distribute the, the systems and to get to affordable price points. All right, I really want to turn around so we always seem to be on the, on the wrong side of having a disadvantaged kind of e economics, right? I want to be Doritos, Chip, crunch all you want, we'll make more. We've got to get to some of the solutions that actually can be employed affordably and can be used in mass to be able to get an asymmetric advantage on our side from a cost kind of equation. There are reasons why we have large, exquisite kind of systems and those won't disappear, but more and more we can't afford to have the ships we need on the surface. We can't afford to have them underwater, they're too expensive, we've got to be able to move towards smaller disaggregated things that have a capability. And we've got to come to the mindset that allows us to have things that are attritable, right? both from the customer standpoint and the community that's providing it. Once it has a tail number, it's like, well, we've got to maintain it for 20, 30 years. Nope. What we've got to look at is certain things that are just minimal viable products, put them out there, learn from it and demonstrate and go back and get into more and more experimentation. This is especially going to be true with autonomy. We didn't focus on it much here. But getting into the idea of frequently experimenting and doing things that way. We can't just do DT, OT, or other things like we have done in the past, or we're just going to get our butts kicked. All right, so it's new ways to approach the problem, how to do it quicker and faster, and it need a commitment from the services and others uh, to be able to do that experimentation. And as much as it pains me, I'll give one shout out to my Navy brethren here that they have put those DevOps squadrons in place in every naval program we're doing. They're involved from the beginning and we have a transition so when we're done, you know, I want every X plane I put to go in the museum but not until I've used up all the life that it possibly can do. Same goes with chips. And so we've been able to put those off so that they can handle all the things we can't answer in a strictly an S&T program on that mill four and everything else. We've got to move to an experimentation mindset across the DOD if we're going to feel the solutions we need quickly accurate enough to maintain the edge. Thank you, sir. With that, I thank you again for your time and attention. I'll be around during the breaks if you've got any questions. Um, but if you ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. So thank you very much.